to the hearing centre. So can, I, can I also access it afterwards if I need to go over somewhere? Yeah, sure. Okay. You can access the transcript also. Okay. If you want to modify anything in 10 days and then we'll publish on it. Cool. Mm -hmm. It's good to <laughs> This is Shu Yang, design architect. Okay. <laughs> All right. So great. Um, well, thanks for taking the, the time to talk to me. Um, so this is uh, a profile that's going to be published in a French magazine called Cosette. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a women's magazine in France that's interested in, in gender issues. And so I'm going to be asking you questions very generally about about your life. <laughs> So maybe we can start with you telling me a bit about your childhood. Uh, where did you grow up? Um, yeah, can you tell me a bit about that? Sure. Uh, I grew up on Earth, uh, still remaining on Earth. Um, I was born in Taipei City mm -hmm. uh, and moved quite a few times. Uh, went to Germany for a year when I was 11. Mm -hmm. um, Went back and uh, went to the Silicon Valley for a while. Um, that was when I was 17 or so. Uh, 18, actually. Uh, and uh, mostly just traveled uh, a lot in my early 20s. About 20 countries. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, otherwise, I'm mostly in Taiwan. Okay. Yeah. Is, would, do you say Taiwan is a place you call home? That it feels the most like... No. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've migrated uh, to the internet uh, around 12. So anywhere that has an internet connection is home. <laughs> uh, anywhere that doesn't is estranged. <laughs> And as, as a child, you lived in Europe so for, for how many years? What was that? Uh, as, as, as a child, when you were in, in Europe, uh, mm -hmm. how many years? There was one year. Oh, one year, okay. Yeah, yeah. Slightly more than one year. Okay. I, I think it was one year and, and a few more. Okay, yeah. and that was in Germany? That was in Germany. Okay. Uh, wh why, why were you in Europe? Uh, my dad went earlier to Germany for a year pursuing PhD studies okay. uh, and then we moved because um, I was finishing the primary school education mm -hmm. at the time uh, two years in advance but in Taiwan there's no way uh, for the high school student to, to jump two grades mm -hmm. um, and so I was left without education uh, mm -hmm. and my, my teachers uh, they all suggested that I went somewhere else um, to experiment and experience different educational systems. And I, I have read that you decided to stop school at 12. Uh, is, is, is that right? And, and why? Or what was the... Yeah, I, I toyed with the idea of stopping school uh, at 12. I said, why? It's just that I ran into this internet thing and discovered that anything I want to learn, there's a much larger community and the time that I spend in school is holding me back um, with stale knowledge. But I didn't actually drop out until I was 14. And how, how did you first start getting interested in, in coding? Do, do you remember what, when you, the first time you, you really found out about it? Sure, I was, when I was eight, mm -hmm. I was reading a programming language book. Uh, for me it was a time saver because I was very interested in mathematics at the time. But arithmetic, as you know, takes a lot of time. So, um, a tool to save time and to make uh, what I've learned, like formula visible uh, and easy to learn, it's something that's, that's great. Uh, I didn't have access to an actual machine at the time, but I was simulating an object. Yes, I read about that. So you, you, you actually drew 
everything, like all the formulas and what they would, yeah, comes would be on paper. That's right. We did it. Oh, that's right. And all the components of a uh, computer. My uh, a acquaintance of mine, Linda Lucas, um, did a uh, children's learning book called Hello Ruby, uh, and she's been spreading this in all different languages around the globe, uh, oh, wow. taking this idea and mm -hmm. having the children, uh, you know, having those paper-made uh, components of computers and connecting them and mm -hmm. uh, simulating key press and writing what a computer would draw in, in a very tangible way, because um, for eight-year-olds, uh, anything that you can touch is much more mm -hmm. um, familiar mm -hmm. uh, with abstractions. Uh, that's you know you can feel it creates a much more intimate relationship between machines and humans. Do you remember what actually drew you to, to, to coding initially? What, what, what was the appeal for you? It's a time saver, as I said. Mm -hmm. I don't have to do arithmetics by hand. Well, that's what computer means, right? It's something that computes for you. And then it also makes it much more visible. And so how, how did you first put it into practice? What were the first uh, things you created, basically? Well, my first program is Hello World, as any other <laughs> programmers are. But uh, my first non-trivial program was a uh, educational game that shows on a line between zero and one um, some balloons. And then uh, the user would guess the position of those balloons. For example, this would be uh, one half, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe you would guess that this is one quarter, um, like one quarter. But then uh, if you type in one quarter, it will show that no one quarter is actually here. Mm -hmm. So you have to guess higher. Right. And then bit by bit, you would learn the, the entire fractional uh, number. This is uh, for my younger brother, who was four at the time. How old were you when you did it? Uh, eight. Eight, yeah. And then after that, how did you move on from that? So, so you created a startup, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was 14. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> what, what kind of startup was it? Uh, it was a publishing house, uh, and I wasn't involved. Uh, at the beginning, I was an author. Mm -hmm. they, they were curating this, nowadays we would call it a blog, but it's basically people writing about their journey toward uh, cyberspace. Um, well, the, the book is called Roads to Cyberspace, and so um, it was on the bulletin board system, which is an online forum, and um, people just pseudonymously <laughs> submitted their, their journeys, and the curational team at the publishing house um, informationist was the name, uh, curates that into a book. And after the book was published, um, I looked at the website of the publisher and saw that it was not very appealing. And so it took a week to code up uh, an unofficial web page. And then it was so appealing that the publishing house decided, okay, maybe they just use this as an official page. Mm. And then uh, gradually, bit by bit, I become kind of the CTO of the publishing house. And then by the time I was 15, the publishing house decided to pivot to change uh, into a software publishing house, um, publishing a few pieces of software that I've written uh, throughout the years. And so that, that's when I become a shareholder and mm -hmm. uh, started running the company. And uh, how long did you stay with that startup? Mm, that was since 95 to 97, I think. Okay, and then after that, what was the next step? After that, I went back to university and uh, attended for a year and a half a lot of graduate stu school studies, trying to understand through humanities and philosophy and 
other uh, disciplines, cognitive science, how to understand the complex behavior that we've seen online. And um, I'm also a consultant, I think, for the BenQ company at the time. BenQ, B-E-N-Q. Um, it was not yet known as BenQ when I joined. It was called Acer Peripherals, which means it's a peripheral company to Acer Corporation. Um, and, uh, and I went to um, in China and as well as Silicon Valley as part of the consultant's work. And eventually we started a startup in Silicon Valley and then in Taiwan around the turn of the century. That was 99 and 2000. Just come back to something you were saying that when you went back to university, mm -hmm. uh, what sort of insights did that provide you on, on the behaviors we see online? What, what did you understand through that? Sure. Um, I had a lot of um, conversations, a, a mentor relationship with a cognitive scientist and philosopher um, in a nearby university. And um, his interest at the time was around what we call consilience, which, is, which means an anti-disciplinary approach, um, studying a problem without constraints of any academic fields. Mm -hmm. um, around that time, these were very vague ideas, complex systems, uh, and sort of anti-disciplinary research. Those were in its very early days. We had some philosophical predecessors like Vera Avent and so on, but there's no methodology, so to speak, in, in this pursuit. So um, that, uh, that was when I started charting, so to speak, my, my own research agenda. Uh, I think that was very helpful in that um, my first mentors, um, there was Tim Lane, as I said, uh, the, a philosopher of uh, cognitive science, uh, and also another philosopher studying um, Gadamer, uh, of the German philosopher, the hermeneutic tradition, and also um, around uh, phenomenology uh, and um, Kant uh, and a lot of other philosophers of science and around science. Right. Um, aside from that, I also studied from the traditional Chinese um, thought process. There was a classical uh, Chinese teacher, Yu Tianzong, who was very instrumental uh, in Taiwan's um, what we call the Xiangtu Wenxue, the, the regional uh, grassroots uh, literature identity. That, that was also what I drew from. And of course also computational linguistics and well, anything I can, I can find locally. That was the, the main inspirations that I drew from. Okay. And what, what did it lead you to understand about how people behave online? Well, a, a few things, right? O online, we're all handicapped in some way. Um, it's as if we enter the world of people on the autism spectrum, in that we're, we're forced to be mostly verbal, because all the nonverbal signals either gets dropped or reduced or somehow, you know, changes meaning through this asynchronous communication. Most people see uh, the cyberspace as something that transcends space, which is true, but I think psychologically the most important part is that it transcends time. It makes a lot of time-delayed uh, conversations. And so uh, it's a self-selecting thing. People who are very good at verbal expressions get disproportionate representation um, and words themselves uh, evolve much quickly. And people tend to trust other people much more quickly just because the same words that they tend to use. And this is something that we don't see in face-to-face -face conversations. Right? Um, so it's in a way compressed but also in a way expanded. Um, the collaboration is much easier because across the internet you can't really harm the other person, except psychologically where we work with that too. And, and also people become fused in a kind of subconscious way 
uh, because one person's emotion, even though the emotion is over, affects other people when they see, after a time delay, um, this kind of emotional utterances. So basically it's like a ecosystem where people's sentiments and affects evolve and compete for the scarcity of attention. And so we see a lot of emotions that are not dominant in face-to-face -face world becomes much easier to dominate in this online world, in particular sentiments of outrage. Um, and that's, that's fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. Get back to um, to the the second startup um, with with the ASR, and then how did it move mm -hmm. on from that? So yeah, I created my my own startup uh, as the president of a small company, um, trying to figure out how open source, um, which was invented around ninety eight, um, this Monica, trying to reconcile the traditional free software world and a commercial software world mm -hmm. by creating something that's of value both to the commercial side and to the civil society. And um, it was fun. It went from 2000, we wrote a manifesto called uh, Cyberspace Anarchy, and trying to figure out all the processes that it would take for a self-governing anarchistic community to thrive online and try to work piecemeal to make it happen. And around 2002, we started working on this Open Foundry project, which would um, be sponsored by the Academia Sinica in Taiwan and become the, the bedrock of the open source community in Taiwan. Um, so that took me a little bit out of the private sector and into the academic and the public sector. And then around 2005, uh, I started leading this international effort of hundreds of computer scientists trying to reinvent the programming language that we use to respond to the new hardware situation, which is that the CPUs stop getting faster, and we get more CPUs, and we get GPUs, and the programming language needs to change because of that. So it's like a rewriting of a constitution of sorts, mm -hmm. recreating a language. Um, and that took me to dozens of countries and it took, I don't know, 2005 to 2008 or so. Mm -hmm. And then I, I joined some uh, Silicon Valley companies around 2008. Um, like which one? Uh, Social Text was the first one. And then quite a few startups uh, as consultants or as shareholders. Um, and two years later, um, an old friend of mine, we've been working on together for 11 years, and he's at Apple, uh, working at, on computational linguistics on Siri. But he wanted to pursue his PhD study, so he invited me to help take care of his department while he went to do his PhD research. Uh, so I helped him carrying that team for six years. Okay. Yeah. Well, when did that start, you said? Uh, 2010. 2010. Okay. okay. And um, then I've, I've heard that from 2011 or so you decided to retire and then mm -hmm. back it. Yeah, that was 2014. Oh, 2014. <coughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we, we got Social Techs acquired in 2013 uh, by a very large company, the Bedford Group. People Fluent was the the HR company that bought Social Text, and so that left me some with some cash. Um, so then, because it was my income was very steady at the time, so I was like, okay, I don't have to work for any company's bottom line anymore. Uh, and so mostly devoted my time to the public sector and the civil society. And yeah, so could you tell me a bit about that? Uh, wh when was the first time you got involved with, with the civil society and, and public sector? 
Well, as I said, um, back in the 96 or so, I was very interested already <coughs> in the online civil rights movement. Because, like free speech and freedom of assembly online, it's as much as a movement as it's an education, because mostly people who didn't have first hand experience didn't really know what this is about. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what I mostly worked on, is on education and uh, awareness campaigns. And then the free software movement, of course, uh, moved into the what we call the free culture movement, which is trying to get more creators to relinquish most of their copyright so that people who they don't know can carry on their work. And I was involved very, very early on. Uh, there was last century stuff. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, there's no clear uh, no. point in which that I got involved with all, all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And when the, the I, I don't know how you said it, but G Go, Gov Zero? Yeah, Gov Zero, <laughs> G Zero, Zero yeah. Yeah. How, Can you tell me a bit about that? Sure. How did that start? It was started by um, the co-author of the Cyberspace Anarchy Manifesto and uh, my co-founder uh, in 2000, uh, Jiayang Gao, or CEO Gao. Um, he was attending a hackathon uh, by Yahoo, and they were originally trying to write some e-commerce site, you know, just very generic hackathon topic. But then at the time, the Taiwanese government ran an advertisement, as you might have already read, that said the uh, economic boosting up plan is too complicated, ordinary citizens doesn't have a chance to understand it, so just follow whatever the government says and trust the government blindly. Um, and it's not a very popular advertisement. <laughs> so, um, filled with outrage, uh, Italian and three of his friends would eventually uh, change their hackathon topic to put a visualization of the total national budget, proving that actually it's not the ordinary citizens not able to understand the part of budget that concerns them, but that, you know, the translation work uh, the government really haven't done. And so this is basically <coughs> what they call forking the government, meaning taking what the government has to offer but taking it to a different direction. Um, and I joined a couple of months later uh, working on a dictionary project. It was early 2013, January. And so the aim here is really to, to take the information that's there and, and make it understandable. Right? Yes, yeah. and once it's understandable, also create a venue for participation. On the original national budget visualization platform, <coughs> budget.gov0.tw, <coughs> budget there's already for each budget item a conversation forum where you can write in your opinions and click whether you want this budget item to increase or decrease or to be cut. And so this creates a, a bidirectional mechanism and it's around specific budget items. People don't talk vaguely about mm -hmm. the national budget, they talk about one item. So it's also a way for participation to happen. Yeah. yeah. Has it had some effects? Like has the sure. government uh, taken into account some? Sure, of course. Um, so by 2014, end of 2014, uh, after the Occupy, a lot of mayors uh, won by appealing to this kind of bidirectional uh, internet-mediated conversation. And so the budget platform became Taipei City's uh, budget platform officially, budget.taipei, which the mayor ran before the participatory budget um, effort because, you know, people really have to understand what the budget is about before proposing mm -hmm. PB, right? And then it's been spreading to six or seven, I think seven now, different cities in Taiwan. And as for the national budget itself, starting, uh, I think, early March, uh, all our presidential promises, um, once they're translated into budget items, they will be visible in a very similar way. And that's a direct result of uh, me being the digital minister, mm -hmm. is that we, we take those proven um, engagement modes and try to maintain it so that they become part of the, the national uh, government.
governance mechanism. Mm -hmm. And is it focused on the budget, or have there also been other types <coughs> of policies and, and, and things that were explained in this way? Sure. Um, it's not just budgets and, and their execution and their, you know, every month or every quarter reviews. We're publishing this online and making it foreign, but we're also publishing online all the regulations and all the trade-related laws 60 days before they be, uh, become in effect <coughs> for public discussion and maybe changing um, the directions. And also we have a national petition system where 5,000 people can countersign a petition and uh, make sure that the government makes a timely and um, useful substantial dialogue. Uh, yeah, we're introducing mechanisms basically all around the policy cycle. Mm -hmm. So whether it's early, whether it's proactive or reactive, whether it was um, government initiated or people initiated, we're trying to make sure that all these are possible. Right. Do, do you have an example w within the budget of one point that was discussed very strongly and then it, something was changed? Sure. For the Taipei city budget, there was a lot of conversation around um, the construction of sport-related facilities. People want to make sure that it's useful for multi-purpose. And um, it was a very large public conversation around the, the so-called large Taipei Dome, and it would benefit a lot from this kind of rad radical transparency. Um, yeah, I should note that after the budget at Taipei launched, people got into this conversation online, just like we did in the Gov Zero National budget. Mm -hmm. But for a national budget, because it was a community effort, people just chatted among themselves. Mm -hmm. But for the Taipei City one, three weeks after this free chatting, people were very surprised to find that every single bureau in Taipei City came and responded to every single topic on the forum. Mm. So, so it's creating a direct line between uh, professional public servants and citizens, circumventing, so to speak, um, the proxies that usually work between them in representative mm. democracy. And people took that as a sign of a very um, authentic goodwill from the city government. And how, how do people in Taiwan react to this? Are they very receptive? Do, do they really want to take part? And has there been a lot of... You know, yeah, yeah. Ta Taiwan's very unique in that the first generation that got access to the internet was also the first generation that had democracy um, because the martial law was lifted only um, at like early 90s, in 89 actually, uh, which is also when the personal computer revolution happened. So we have the same generation interested in internet and in democracy. Mm. And to what extent do you feel that the, the philosophy, that the sort of prevalence on the internet is, is being translated in, in civic or political affairs through these kinds of initiatives? Is, is it the same philosophy? That's sure. Yeah, on the internet, uh, what we call this is a, what we call a open multi-stakeholder governance model, meaning that we try to get everyone who would be affected by a policy to come and discuss. But of course, this is not um, entirely applicable, as I said at the very beginning. The internet community was able to make this happen because in the early days, everybody who had participation was very good at reading and writing. Um, and at imagining things, building castles, uh, just by reading words. Mm -hmm. but, but this is by necessity because that's what programmers do. That's what code makers and lawmakers do, right? Um, but it's also kind of exclusive. People uh, who did not have this kind of skill, mm -hmm. but have other very useful inputs, are excluded from the multi-stakeholder process on the early internet. Um, so for things like the, the national or regional policy, uh, of course it affects not only people who are good at reading and writing, mm -hmm. but also people who are good at nonverbal communication, at uh, body language, at, mm -hmm. uh, at all sorts of children even, uh, mm -hmm. who prefers tangible um, stuff. So I mean, um, to do a good public speaking process is now our duty to make it multimodal, meaning that we not only need to translate the abstractions to 
um, graphic or interactive or audiovisual ways that people can relate to, but also take as input all those non-writing um, sources and make sure that everybody can understand everybody across the different cognitive functions. It was very expensive to do things this way, but nowadays with artificial intelligence it's much easier. So how can yeah how, how can you use artificial intelligence to take inputs that are not verbal? How does that work? Well, for example, um, the the words that we're speaking into this recorder, um, we're we're feeding it to a um, artificial intelligence that transcribes this into words, mm -hmm. um, and this technology was only mature this year, really, mm -hmm. um, and if people who don't speak English, another artificial intelligence can take this and then translate it to English, mm -hmm. uh, approximating already human translators. Um, and that's another thing. And once it's translated into Chinese, another artificial intelligence can take it and create real-time visualizations of all the topics that we've been discussing and uh, showing relevant information um, that may fill in people who are not versed in the, you know, what multi-stakeholderism is, right? Uh, they could create a translation of memory or a lexicon. And then yet another artificial intelligence can take that and try to create some, you know, 3D models and relevant mm -hmm. pictures and try to find uh, relevant um, images that corresponds to what we were talking right. about and so on. So every step, of course, it needs human curation, mm -hmm. but the, the uh, mundane work is now actually carried by a lot of uh, automated mechanisms. And, and what about taking into account people's non-verbal expressions? Right, uh, and so if you take a uh, transcript and the uh, actual recording, whether it's visual or, or audio, uh, and you subtract the verbal message from it, then what you're left, the remainder is the style mm -hmm. or the non-verbal expression. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's already possible, for example, to take a picture of Van Gogh and then a photo of something that Van Gogh has never seen and then ask the artificial intelligence to apply the Van Gogh style mm -hmm. to this painting and then create a, a that style of painting. So not only we can transfer um, concepts, but we can also transfer the remainder, which is style. And so uh, artificial intelligence at the moment can assign emotional um, weight to tell irony, <laughs> to tell uh, the, the impact of, of effect of what people are stressing or putting into words. Mm -hmm. And yet other artificial intelligence may direct a facilitator's attention mm -hmm. if you have 10 people or 20 people in a room, mm -hmm. a virtual room maybe, mm -hmm. uh, to get an emotional assessment. Because a good facilitator needs to be in tune to everybody's non-verbal mm -hmm. state, which is very difficult across the internet. Even you have the best um, you know, video conference and stuff, still something is lost, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. so we're trying to get that, ba that back. Um, and of course the facilitator would then need to either have a uh, panorama of a view of every other participants, or we can use the cheaper technology, which is called uh, virtual reality, which is mature as if maybe later this year. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're trying all kinds of modalities to bring the nonverbal signals back to our um, cognitive systems. And uh, what about your current post? How, how did that come about? How were you approached? And um, yeah, what was the process? Well, there was a um, presidential campaign um, like Dr. Tsai Ing-wen. I voted for her, thinking it's very like radically progressive by Asian standards, mm -hmm. yeah, somewhat progressive by European standards. And in any case, um, one part of the platform was called the uh, Asia Silicon Valley plan. But due to a um, unfortunate grammatical fact of Chinese, um, when people see Asia, Silicon Valley, they think Asian Silicon Valley, right. meaning a Silicon Valley in Asia. 
uh, which is something that's kind of offensive to people who actually work in Silicon Valley and knowing you can't really duplicate it here. Mm -hmm. And it's also unfair to Taiwanese culture, which I think have a lot to comment that is not part of Silicon Valley, which we actually thrives because of this. So it's it's doing a an injustice to both Taiwan and Silicon Valley. Um, so because of that, there's a lot of resistance, especially around um, the startup circles, to this policy. And so the premier at the time, Lin Chen, um, well, he's still the premier, uh, said put a hold to this platform, saying that we need to readjust and try a different communication strategy, so that people wouldn't think that we're rebuilding a science park around the digital economy mm -hmm. in the Taoyuan city for no purpose whatsoever. So um, I was part of that redefinition meeting and uh, suggested that we put a, a dot between Asia and Silicon Valley so that people understand that, that we're just connecting. right? We're linking with Asia, we're connecting to Silicon Valley, but we're not trying to be Silicon Valley of Asia. It doesn't work. It does seem to work. Uh, the startup circle seems to understand that. So I would say, yeah, I, I did some communication work. Premier seems impressed and um, asked me to try to find a minister for digital affairs to, to play a similar role um, to, to make sure that misunderstandings like this don't happen again. So I asked around, I asked a lot of my friends, um, I think around 10 people. Mm -hmm. um, about five of them, I think, are more suited to this job than I am. <laughs> um, but they all refused. Um, citing one reason or another, but mostly saying that they would not enjoy this work. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but they all think that I, well, at least at least while I'm, I may not be the best fit, uh, at least I enjoy this work, <laughs> so, which is kind of important. So uh, they all recommended me, and so I, I said to the premier that I can't find anyone else, but. I'm willing to give it a try, mm -hmm. and then that's how I got in. Okay. Yeah. When did you start? Uh, it was 1st of October. Okay. And what, what are your main, uh, main tasks? <laughs> <laughs> well, open government <coughs> is the main mandate, and it's a supporting factor. Also the youth council, uh, which is like open government, but especially for young people. Mm -hmm and then uh, social enterprises, which is mostly around young people and startups, but also um, carries this social impact and sustainability in this mission, that's why it's remanded. But open government is the, the main one. And so what are your main uh, projects for the next few months? What, what, what are you planning to do? As I said, there's this systematic establishment of multi-stakeholderism around all parts of the policy cycle. Mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to make this happen through uh, regulations, through bylaws. We're trying to pass this digital telecommunication law, which is the fundamental law for internet. It's like the, the digital republic law in France. Uh, it established this basic engagement rules between the existing legal system and the internet. And the important part of that law is a multi-stakeholder mechanism. Um, this public commentary period, this public forum for all the policies, far as I understand, uh, it was in the original draft of the French Digital Republic Law. Mm -hmm. It was removed by the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, we were we thought that we would just look up to the France and to the implementation <laughs> details, but that never happened. <laughs> so, so, so we're trying to make this happen. Now, so so yeah, just just getting governments to public servants to trust strangers to trust citizens more, and maybe the citizens would trust more in return eventually. And what what's the situation in Taiwan in terms of? I mean, there was the the sunflower movement. Uh, how, how is that? working out? Is it still ongoing or...? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, the Sunflower Movement was the Occupy that 
extended for 22 days. Um, but the main appeal, I think, was this kind of demonstration that people can really work with strangers, half a million strangers on the street, helped with professional facilitators and fact, like um, fact checkers, translators, and also um, a way for a recording to appear. Um, and all three skills taken together creates a deliberative, reflective space where people in this Occupy converge every day towards a consensus gradually. And so the final consensus that was agreed by the occupiers and also by the head of parliament at this time um, was that this is a, a rethink of constitutional um, organization of the society, that all political decisions from here onwards need to take all the stakeholders into account, not just the ordinary associations and their representatives. And that the tools that we developed through those 22 days are all open source and free culture, and that they're taking the seats uh, all around Taiwan and the globe to, to make sure that people understand that there is now a way for strangers in the real space to converge Mm-hmm. if they, they put attention to it. Mm-hmm. And this is the promise, really, of any Occupy. Right? Mm-hmm. But Taiwan is radically non-violent. So we, we did this in a very systematic fashion. It's almost like a, a case study. Uh, so I wouldn't say it's just, just in the Taiwan. Mm-hmm. And whatever we, we did was a, a model for Nidibu, for, for all the occupiers afterwards which of course then improved our methodologies, just as we did building on the Occupy Wall Street mm-hmm. in the other occupies. But like in Hong Kong, do you feel that they were inspired by Well, yeah, I mean, they, they took exactly the same programming. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, they, they supported logistics, um, and uh, it, it's, it's really a, a export uh, <laughs> of, of, of the sunflower <laughs> technologies um, mm-hmm. to, to Hong Kong. And is, is, is the situation still quite tense with some people from the movement and the new government, or, or are they very much behind the new government? It's a little bit of both. Okay. Um, the Sunflower Occupiers eventually would form two parties, um, the Social Democrats and the New Powers. The New Powers became the third largest party in the parliament. The Social Democrats um, still remains mostly on the street, um, but also in the city governments. They, they got a lot of people into city governments. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I wouldn't say, well, as, as political worker, not as mayors, uh, but then we get people who are independents, like non-partisans, mm-hmm. uh, into mayors, like the Taipei mayor, mm-hmm. but also uh, in the cabinet. In the cabinet, in this cabinet, there's more independence than members of any party, which is kind of rare. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's a, a new political climate of, mm-hmm. of independence. The parliament is, of course, still pretty partisan, but at least there's this one dominating party, mm-hmm. the, the Democratic Progressives. And uh, the new powers has been pretty vocal, but I wouldn't say they're behind the democratic progressives. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, could you talk a bit about your, your decision to, to change genders? How, when did you decide that? And yeah, how, how did you know that, that that was something you wanted to do? Oh, no, I never changed genders. Okay. <laughs> my, my genders, whatever. Okay. <laughs> um, but when I encountered people online when I was 12 or so, uh, especially people from the U.S. Uh, in those communities, my online interactions, they perceive as decisively feminine. Okay. Yeah, and, and I wouldn't mind, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and so, for many communities, 
starting from 93, that I have just lived as a woman. But for other communities, sometimes they perceive it as a man, sometimes it doesn't really matter. And my startup friends were all LGBTQ people, mm -hmm. so it doesn't really matter. And uh, so, no, oh, that, that isn't fair. There's one straight person, but in any <laughs> case, <laughs> we're, 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 we're very diverse. So, <laughs> so, um, so it, was, it was great. I mean, um, I was raised essentially through adolescence in online and offline environments that doesn't care about gender. It's gender blind, so to speak. Um, which I think made me kind of consciously gender blind mm -hmm. ever afterwards. Because um, it's not really useful, especially online, but also offline, to stereotype people. That's pretty much it. Did you feel that more and more young people think like that? I mean, I was living in America before, and then it feels like it's a big movement now. I mean, a lot of people just decide that gender is not relevant. Yeah, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Is that also like that here in Taiwan? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Taiwan's unique in, in Asia in that we have a huge uh, LGBTQ community, mm -hmm. uh, very vocal. I think it was tied to Taiwan's quest for absolute freedom of expression. Uh, it, it would be like a just a slogan in other countries, especially European countries. Mm. But in Taiwan, people took it very seriously. Mm. Um, Any time the government even had the inkling of trying to censor speech, people just got very outraged, and that never happened. So, so we kind of took as you know the core uh, of the community building that everybody, no matter of gender or whatever other status, must have an equal say. Um, I think that contributes to this huge explosion of um, LGBTQ communities. This, this radical demand for free expression, is that something that started after 89? That, that's when it really um, yeah. so tended to not go back. It's a, it's a reaction formation, really, right? It was a dictatorship. And people died as martyrs <laughs> quest, uh, in the quest for absolute expression freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what's the role of China in all of this? How, how does it try and, and influence Taiwan and, and go against this free expression? Because, I mean, I know in Hong Kong they're not really allowed to do what they mm -hmm. want. To right, 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 right. So Hong, Kong's, Hong Kong's in a very difficult place. Mm -hmm. at the moment. Well, the, the mainland China, I think, as opposed to Hong Kong China, mm -hmm. the mainland China um, is doing a lot of interesting social experiments. At the beginning of the Great Firewall Project, the Golden Shield, um, Taiwan was very much caught in it. We had to, because there was also during the years where there was a lot of commercial flow between mainland and mm. uh, Taiwan. Because post-89, um, there was a while where foreign investors didn't really want to deal with China. Um, but Taiwan still supplied a lot of talents and ICT technologies in the, um, China's modernization mm -hmm. project. And so uh, the Golden Shield is something that affects pretty much everyone in Taiwan who travels to, to China. Mm -hmm. And we were acutely aware of every step of its evolution. Mm -hmm. So we, we had our Snowden moments <laughs> years <laughs> before <laughs> um, it became an international phenomenon, knowing that the same technologies that enables the open internet can also uh, do something more and something uh, very different. And so we live with that technology as a neighbor and the most severe <laughs> uh, stakeholder mm -hmm. uh, outside mainland China for, for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I worked on technologies that um, circumvent the, the Great Firewall, technologies that works inside the Great Firewall for a very long time. I would say it's just a, a different experiment they're running there.
have asked you all of my questions. And maybe one last thing. Um, you, you described yourself in some articles as a, a conservative anarchist. Mm -hmm. Could you explain what you mean by that? Why, why conservative? Sure. A uh, conservative has two meanings. One is that I have some values I want to preserve, right? As in conservancy, as in conserving <laughs> a, a a tradition, right? Uh, and the tradition is the tradition that I've been living in for more than twenty years now. Um, the anarchistic tradition of internet uh, code making, and the code making community. Uh, it's really the first political system that I encountered. It was run by rough consensus and not by voting, not by presidents, not by kings. And um, it's a tradition that was raised in, and so it's something that I want to conserve. But I also mean conservative in the other part, which is the approach. Um, a conservative is rather than a progressive wants people to see that they can work with some new why gradually, rather than changing or mandating or commanding people to change overnight. So everyone who works with me joins on a voluntary basis. Uh, they set their goals on a voluntary basis. I try to facilitate them, uh, but I don't really give commands. Mm -hmm. And that holds true before I was a digital minister, and still is true. Mm -hmm now, so I'm conservative in the, in the sense that it's a very gradual change. Nobody is forced uh, to, to change if they don't want. Did, did that create a bit of a clash of culture here? Because I can imagine there's some like, very established ways of, of, of working in, in government. I think so far it's, it's just fine. <laughs> so far it's just fine. Because if I had a ministry, mm -hmm. that would be very difficult mm -hmm. because there would already be a hierarchical yeah. organization. But I have an office, I don't have a, a ministry. Mm -hmm. And from the very beginning, I said this is not really an office, it's a space. Mm -hmm. It's an open space that people. Are welcome to join. Well, I said it's people are welcome to join, and then some folks, like the one over there, uh, decided that it's better call a space. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a volunteer. Right. So, so basically, um, it's a space where where people volunteer to join. Um, we're all like strangers, really. I, I, I don't know most of my staff, <laughs> and I certainly haven't worked with any of my staff except over the internet um, for, for just a, a few months at most. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it, it's really like any other ad hoc group. Mm -hmm. We started with very simple um, coordination forms, mm -hmm. uh, like chat rooms and uh, Kanban boards, but gradually had a, a alignment of, of compass but we don't have a map, everybody has their own map. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's the culture we're we're trying to do here. Uh, and so the reason why this is possible at all is that it's not a ministry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm not forced to give commands. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but so of the fifteen people, sixteen now, uh, in this space and of the thirty to fifty people as our participation offices where all the ministries and of the twenty five youth counselors. Uh, we're, we're holding the same interaction engagement pattern mm -hmm. and, and this is because none of them are here because they are commanded to. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Great, well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, can I just ask you your age? My age? Yes. Uh, 35 solar years. Okay. And so I, I take it now you're based full-time in, in, in Taiwan or do you still all over. Yeah, I try to to reduce carbon emission <laughs> before I before I uh, become a digital minister. I was working on telepresence technology, mm -hmm. so I would send robots, um, like in in Spain and also in in Boston and other places. So I still travel, but virtually, and I also invite my friends to to here uh, through robotic means. I think by next year at most that would become 
much more appealing and mm -hmm. it costs around the same as air travel mm -hmm. but you can reuse it it's much more carbon neutral Okay, uh, I'd like to take a few pictures of you, if that works. Uh -huh. Okay, great. 